fantastic. Welcome back, everyone. We've got uh, Dr. Sukhum Kim here from the University of Aberdeen, and his recent uh, sorry, paper is called Friction of Plates and the Role of the Body. We'll have 30 minutes uh, for talk and then 10 minutes for questions. Thank you. I'll pick up on each of my friend's comments. Uh, it's a micro message. Um, or just my parents call me, they call me in. <laughs> <laughs> I must say, uh, this from the beginning, even if the title of this keynote sounds theoretical and objective, it really should be considered a very personal, intuitive, and successful. And more than anything else, it should be considered to be questions, or a series of questions, or explorations, rather than an answer or analysis. So the first thing first, the title. It is at least clearly descriptive in what I would say there is a body plays a role, in fact, a quite descriptive decisive role in producing sound. And that's it, I think, uh, uh, you know, we agree all that and that's it, kill this sound. Uh, but perhaps not, I probably uh, need to question a bit more about the title. So for example, uh, what do I mean by production? I follow the observation made by uh, Gumbrad Gumbr in his book, Production of Presence, What uh, Meaning Cannot Convey, where he says, production then is used according to the meaning of its etymological root that refers to the act of bringing forth an object in space. The word production is not associated here with the manufacturing of uh, artifacts or industrial uh, merchandise. Now, and with the place, I mean to invite my, to my question all the possible or prob probable both physical and virtual places that we can sense, experience, or imagine. As with a works by Tuan and Casey, I have often used the notion of place in contrast to that of space. For example, in space and place, Tuan argues that when people speak of uh, space, they often mean they often mean place. So he said that in experience, the meaning of space often merges with that of place. Space is more abstract than place. What begins as undifferentiated space becomes place, as we get to know more about more but better, and then endowed it with a barrier. Similarly, Case points out in his book, uh, getting back to getting back into place towards the renewed understanding of the place world, that um, most of what we know of space may be based on the framework of a place. So he says the to exist at all as a material or mental object, or as an experienced observed event, is to have a place, i.e. to be in place, however minimally or imperfectly or temporarily. Anyway, while interesting, the relations between space and place is not my goal here, and I will move on. So I said that um, the, the production of place is therefore bringing forth, or perhaps helping, causing, or forcing to emerge, be present, or manifest all possible or probable places. Furthermore, I, what I'm interested in exploring this, in this talk is not all potential places, but those in, rela in relation to what I do with the sound. And finally, the body. I mean, uh, and only this I mean, my body my human physical body and its various possibilities and potential. And furthermore, my body should be qualified as the body of me as a composer and sound artist, and not necessarily that of, that of any, anyone else. So when and how I became interested in place is to question when and how I became interested in sound as an art medium. But I don't think I considered uh, place as a key issue in composing listening in the beginning. Uh, as some of you might already know, I first experienced and started to listen to electric music or so-called acoustic music in 1998, 1999. And it was Dennis Morley's, um, uh, every, every time I try to say it, uh, it's quite difficult, uh, for, and yes, Not classically trained and not attending on music or art school per se, my only option at the time to find more about this kind of music was to listen and listen repeatedly. 
I think there are wealth of benefits by listening to One Piece again and again. And it is by far the best method that I know for someone like me who not only wants to appreciate of the piece, but also be critical and, and, and analytical. And more than anything else, it helps me develop both aesthetic and technical imagination. At that time, when I was just starting out, my listening was very much focused on those that I can decipher and imitate. And along the way, I started to discover what, and what, how, and when to imagine in and through sound. So after Punkt, uh, the, the, the other two pieces that I think I had listened to most of the time were Wind Chimes by the Surrey and Clown by John Tennyson. And along with this, Interiors and Interplays by Eric uh, Mikhail Carson. And I think you can hear from my piece, my, my really, uh, my second piece, in, uh, called Midon, written in 1999, and what I have learned from those. So I'm going to play just, uh, just uh, 30 seconds in the beginning. So as you can hear, my main uh, interest in that piece was to do with the temporal and dynamic quality of musical gestures and gestures in patterns, which are quite narrative and has a strong sense of us moving forward and uh, this sense of continuity and persistency. I don't think that the notion of place was any, any importance in my composition process at the time. However, I believe that I was beginning to recognize the possibility of this art practice, which affords the production of place through in, uh, in a very peculiar way. And I began to explore this further in my later pieces, like What the Good Saw or what Godwin. So I'm going to play a, I'm going to play uh, just a snippet of the, uh, the beginning of the Godwin. Godwin is, by the way, uh, it's, a, it's a Korean word named A Great Flowers. So in common, places emerge through their possibility or probability of becoming as such, not through representations or 
soliloquy. Therefore, one can find a sense of place, but can never be sure which place it is. In other words, place is emerged as Uh, sorry. Uh, therefore, one can have a sense of place, but can never be sure which place it is. In other words, places emerge as emerge as possibilities, but rarely, if not ever, as certainties. And in this process, the piece plays the various sound images, each of which continuously negotiates with the listener whether it, in relation to it, in relation to the, the other sound images can be cons constituted as a place. What is peculiar in this negotiation uh, is how my body becomes situated. A sound image or a network of sound images does not constitute a place mm -hmm. until I, I can successfully imagine my body having been placed. And not only placed, a successful place as a sound image seems to afford the possibilities of my body navigating in and around place. Thus, more than anything else, how possible or probable my body can be placed and move around determines the intensity of the place. And furthermore, in Fordman, the places experienced as such becomes the sharpened when places as sound images disintegrate and my virtual body is thrown out from them with equal instance intensity. And I have discussed this process of listening to the relation between body image and the place image in my discussion where I borrow the, uh, this methodology of negation implemented by Rosalind Cross, whose seminal paper on sculpture in, uh, in the 1960s and 1970s Title sculpture in the expanded uh, field. Krauss attempted, attempted to embrace a contemporary sculptural practice by expanding the concept of a sculpture through the operation of negation, through which she was able to establish a cautionary framework of a sculptural discourse and explain and situate works that were otherwise perceived as perplexing or outside sculptural field. And now, in a similar fashion, I try to identify the negotiation that occurs in composing and listening to my music and music that in which body and place and sound images seem to be at work. This quaternary framework of electro electro music listening is constructed upon the claim that when listening to electro music, listeners imagine sound images principally through their connection to body and place. But at the same time, its workings are also contingent upon the fact that its electric music often challenges the listener's ability to listen in terms of those sound images, encouraging them to hear the physical properties of sound rather than their possible sources or images, thus negating these body images and place images. As a matter of fact, Sound art practice such as abstract music is fundamentally based on this negation of a body and place. That is to say, any operations <coughs> in abstract music, both in composing and listening, are premised upon bracketing my body and also bracketing the place in which my body is situated my body is situated at a given moment. The very fact that Optimate music concerns with the disembodied sound, that is, sound whose source are not shown, result in my body losing physical contact with things in the world. <coughs> However, this loss of physical contact does not mean that my body loses its role or become useless. Quite uh, as rather in Optimate music, my body transforms from the physical to the virtual or to the imagined. And in doing so, it gains power of imagine, imaginary listening, which I have also discussed in my discussion. The act of imaginary listening is easily observed in our daily life, where our perception, uh, perception of events is typically only partial. And 
thus, our body is in a so-called oxymetric situation, a situation in which we hear sound while having the visual verification of the making of the sound denied or challenged. On the other hand, oxymetric music is premised upon my intentional listening attitude where the place in which my physical body is situated is bracketed and thus negated. I have discussed this attitude or situation in more detail in my paper delivered at uh, EMS 2014 in Berlin, which I call Studio Aesthetics. A set of comp compositional aesthetics or a, a particular set of attitudes toward composing, which was born out of the uh, composer's relationship with sound, music, and consequently the lived world. Which, that, which has been established in and enhanced by a studio, and furthermore, in a concert hall, the place where we practice this bracketing of the, of the body. One characteristic of a typical oxymetic concert, which sets the listener experience uniquely apart from that of the traditional classical instrument concert, is that listeners feel as if they were invited the composer's studio and will witness his or her very act of making. The dynamic nowness of happenings and the sense of assumed immediacy from the composer to the listeners are sometimes so compelling that the listeners may even imagine they were <coughs> given it as if they were participating in, in composing the piece they hear. This phenomenon is interesting as it shows that in a cosmetic concert, the composer's studio becomes enlarged. That is, the concert venue comes into the composer's own studio. While it appears to be natural and certainly accessible some and benign, the consequences of this transmutation of the concert hall into the large version of the composer's studio are significant. In the way, in the, way the listeners experience first the performance of electronic uh, music, and by turning concert venue into his her own studio in this manner, the composer effectively brings to the audience this so-called studio aesthetics. And this studio aesthetics, I think, is the result of our continuous bracketing of both our physical body and our physical place where our body is located. So it appears that this studio aesthetics has some key characteristics. The first and immediately recognizable characteristic of the studio and its aesthetic is ritual. It is assumed that studio is devoid of or vacant of anything particular. It is thus assumed that whatever you bring into the studio or produce is that which it is and, and nothing else. And the second characteristic of studio is that it has the focal point and is hierarchical. In the studio, one spot is more significant than the other, and there is one particular spot that takes the most attention and care of the all the other spots in the studio, which we call uh, the sweet spot. And furthermore, studio is the hierarchical. Even with the multi-channel setups that allow us to attempt the even use of the speakers, the directionality of the studio, <coughs> so front, back, and left, right, sets the priority of the one element Thirdly, the studio is detached, separated, and afloat from the lived world. Its design and aesthetics aspire to create a container, a hollow space with the layers of walls and ceilings and floors that, through which nothing transmits or sits outside. Fourthly, the studio guarantees reproducibility. Those which are created in the studio are assumed to be reproducible against all odds that the lived world may throw at you. As many of us have heard, we often say a good piece of music, or in this case, good piece of oxymetic music, is the one that travels well. And fifthly, the studio is just subtractive. What I mean by this is that due to what the studio affords, my experience of a sound as a totality is <coughs> dissected, examined, and interrogated to a point at which such a totality is somehow further, further away from itself. 
One night, the experience of being in the studio by listening to the song outside the studio is as an opportunity. Yes, I'm able and willing to engage in reduced listening outside, so-called echo share, uh, which is a phenomenological method. But as soon as I'm there in an echo share, I'm immediately brought back to where I am, as there are so many other things to listen to. And when I'm back, my listening to the sound in question becomes richer, as I have gained awareness not only of the sound, but also its being in a place in the world. And finally, the studio assumes an even strength and fixates the composer-listener relationship. In the studio, the listener is always already imagined. She can never come to a being and participate in the, in the act of making. Over the last few years, few years I became increasingly unsatisfied with how I produce places through the studio aesthetics, which are engendered by bracketing my body or place. And this recognition came in tandem with my recent research on uh, reduced listening proposed by Shepard as a phenological reduction, which I have discussed in one of my papers, which uh, was delivered uh, at the Pierre Chappell Conference in 2010. In it, I, I follow the line of arguments made by contemporary phenomenologists that a proper or a complete phenomenological analysis targets the totality of phenomena that emerge through experience, which include both the qualita qualitative character of what we experience and the subjective character of the mental act whereby we experience, which was by uh, Thompson. <coughs> However, on the reduced listening proposed by Schaeffer, it is not the totality of the phenomen phenomenon given to our experience in listening that is our investigative object. Rather, we are led to only part of the listening experience, and our investigation as a phenomenological project seems crippled. So I continue to point out that according to Minio, Min uh, a proper reduction as a phenomenological method combines actually two moves, a negative one and a positive one. The negative move consists in suspending what blocks the way the phenomena, which uh, I believe the reduced listening works. The positive move is actually return, uh, re reductive to the specific mode of appearing of the phenomena. Here I find it unsatisfying to, to bracket my body and place in order to produce place. This reduction only brings forth places that are imaginary or possible, although fantastic and sometimes even sublime, these places to me result from a certain <coughs> epistemological pitfall, which seems to reproduce metaphysical or increasingly hermeneutical or interpretive understanding of the world. But it makes it difficult for us to get to the presence of a body or a place. I have recently considered ways of return to the place. Not a return as a turning back from what I have been doing, but return as a proper phenomenological reduction, which reevaluates the studio and combines both the negation and the rediscovery of the body and the place. And I think it would be interesting to compare the studio to the gallery in the visual art. The gallery has been challenged and criticized quite extensively in the visual art in the 50s and 60s. Interestingly, due to its properties and consequent aesthetic implications that are very similar to what the studio has. And there are numer numerous visual art pieces that we can think of, but I would like to talk about works by Robert Owen, American, uh, I guess, multimedia artist. So here's an example by Robert Owen. It's called the line painting. In the early 60s, Owen had gone through a very intense self interrogative period that eventually marked a, a breaking point, the most important pivotal point in his artistic career. Having started as a post-expressionist painter, 
or we might have had a similar relationship with his studio and the gallery as any other artist in his and previous times. Between 1962 and 1963, however, he was determined to get to the bottom of what painting was for him. And as a methodology, he used boredom. He locked himself in the studio, limiting all social connection to the bare minimum, spending 12 to 15 hours a day for two years without break. He started drawing lines. After these two years, he opened the door to the studio and brought, brought out from it 10 paintings, which each of which had a two lines. Since the so-called line painting period, he began gradually and but effectively breaking himself away from the studio, severing the link. And by, by 1970, he completely abandoned his studio, selling or giving away what was left in his studio, making works that are now not studio-based, but pieces that are in the world. Now, 10 years later, when he was asked to, to do an do an installation in the same building where his former studio used to be, he did not go to backtrack to his studio. Instead, he knocked, knocked down the wall of the studio, which is, I believe, an act of both symbolic and figurative at the same time, but also physical and literal. By removing the wall, not only did he let the wall in the studio, but also he, he let the studio out in the world. Here I would like to step, stop and target the idea and implication of boredom as a methodology that Owen used. <laughs> Owen's boredom results from the two limitations that, as the procedures that he set out. He locked himself in the place, in the studio, the place that, uh, that is most familiar to him, and he occupied, took the place, and he did take the place for two years. He took time in the place. Discussing the different, different types of glance at the world, Edward Case outlines the various attitudes towards what we glance in, in the order of an interesting level of attention. So if you take a look at this, we start with indifference to the world and gradually become interested in and become come to the level of a delight, aversion, and astonishment. I think that uh, most of us artists try to be in that astonishment or delight. We, ev that we uh, ever aspire to be in boredom. Casey explains that, oh, sorry. Casey explains that in boredom, I care enough such our surface for their possible interest. This is because I once had, a, had an interest in them, but they did not deliver anything striking enough to engage me then. And as a direct result, I became bored. But this boredom can be dissipated by discovering something striking after all in the same surfaces, something that will fulfill my in empty intention, which was uh, uh, the, the concept by us. So taking time and taking place as a methodology continued and was persistently implemented for Owen for two years as for him. As for him, the consequent boredom was the most effective tool to deconstruct the artistic and social practice that had been firmly fixated on in and on his studio. Owen explained, Boredom is a very good tool, because whenever you play creative games, what you normally do is you bring to the situation all your aspirations, all your assumptions, all your ambitions, all your stuff. And then you pile it up on your painting, reading into the painting all the things that you want it to be. I'm sure it's the same with the writing. You wrote it up, all up, with all the illusions about what it is. Boredom is a great way to break that. You do the same thing over and over again until you
you are both split with it, then all your illusions, aspirations, everything just drains off. And now what you see is what you get. I think this boredom is a phenomenological reduction. And differs from the boredom in the so-called natural attitude. Being a type of approche, the boredom has a goal driven by enough care based on the hope that it will eventually achieve the so-called empty intention as Percy argued. Furthermore, Owen's boredom was not something that he could turn away and forget. He was locked in the place for two years which was not only a psychological, but also a physical endeavor. So I thought about this, and I tried to implement that a little bit, not as uh, rigorously as, as Robert Owen. So in my cross-disciplinary project on place, which is titled, titled as the, the Fate of Place, I have, I have also used taking time and taking place as a methodology to move away from the studio aesthetics and the consequence consequently listening attitude. The phase of place consists of the four sub-projects, and I would like to uh, particularly focus on one of the four projects, which is titled Being Persistently in Place One. Being Persistently in Place One is a study of being in a place, targeting particularly the central place in London, which is, of course, the Union Street. Now, the Union Street is the center of Aberdeen where a lot of people frequent. It is a place for commuting, shopping, meeting people, and entertaining, but it's not a place for staying. People move fast on Union Street. They leave the central street as fast as they enter. But being a center of Aberdeen, Union Street is a producer of a rhythm in social time, as Lefebvre said. So he said, to know the city requires to know its rhythm. And following him, the studying the rhythm of the Union Street, the center of Aberdeen, the listening strategy based on the studio aesthetics would not work. Instead, one needs to be become a so-called rhythm analysis, which will be attentive, but not only to the world of pieces of information, he will also listen to the world, and above all to what is disdainfully called the noises which are said without meaning, and to murmurs, full of meanings. And finally, he will listen to silence as well. Analyzing the rhythm of a city, or any other which produces a rhythm, requires a peculiar methodology, according to Lefebvre. To analyze it, one must get outside, it, outside of it. Ex externality is necessary, because one cannot analyze a rhythm when they live in it. But at the same time, in order to grasp a rhythm, one must have been grasped by it, having, been aban having given or abandoned oneself inwardly to the time that it will, it will rhythm. So to study the rhythm of a uh, place and to analyze the sound, one should not be fully engaged in it, but perhaps just enough care for listening and for the place. Being outside the rhythm means uh, being outside the sink. Lefebvre gives an example. We do not dress the rhythm of our own body until we become sick, until we suffer. So I decide to suffer. In being persistent in place, I took a walk from one end of the Union Street to the, the other end of the Union Street. Google Maps tells me it takes about 14 minutes. Uh, normal walk, I, and I usually walk really fast. Uh, but I decide to move up really, really slowly. So I calculate everything, So in uh, which is the, the distance is about 1.8 miles, uh, which is, will take about 14 minutes. And if you rather walk fast, like I do, it will only take about 30 minutes. So my goal for this performance site specific listening and rhythm analysis was to walk as slowly as possible and listen to the sound around me and listen for the, any changes that I can grasp. At the same time, I allow any other sensorial data, including the glance and the gaze. In the end, 
My first listening and reading Kandinsky's work on New Year's Day took a full four hours, so only 40 minutes, which meant that I walked about 17 to 20 times slower than my normal walking speed. During the walk, my body moves, albeit very slowly. My listening to the street has obviously a focal point, the place where my listening body is. But as I am moving very slowly, I recognize at every moment that the focal point moves also very slowly. My listening attitude based on the studio aesthetics is a continually, continuously challenged. The most surprising thing is that <coughs> it is extremely difficult to keep listening. <coughs> you can never engage in listening for 240 minutes. Taking time and taking place puts me to the boredom of a such a listening. Furthermore, my body starts to ache after about one hour. My listening body resists, and most importantly, and as a consequence of the above, taking time and taking place gradually and effectively open up my listening, my listening, revealing that the listening as we understand and believe we perform in one instant. In fact, consists of a multivariate and heterogeneous activity, activities of listening. So taking time and taking place as a methodology breaks open the body bracketed by studio aesthetics, helping it regain its role in bringing forth and renewing the place it occupies. Thank you. comment that the question at the beginning when you played the piece about the gate of flowers yes. uh, is it intentional that you show an image and the title and the description and, and how that affects what we imagine because it sounds on its own as one thing but then you're effectively loading up the listener with a, with a concept of what the piece is so I wonder yeah, I guess I used to be very worried of that thing, but now I don't care much. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because the, uh, the you can never, uh, this, 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 this connection, uh, which I mentioned here in the oxygenative classification, this, this connection is, is, n is never going to work. Uh, it's somehow to any kind of information, the way I talk, the way I look, or even if you say, oh, I don't say anything, play. Uh, all the information is there. The, not, not to say the title or image. So now I become more uh, lenient, I guess, or open to the idea that well, how about I, depending on the situation, how about I give this information because it's available. And you have to listen so that the role becomes not, uh, it's not my role anymore. So it's, a, it's there and then the listeners take whatever they want, whatever they want to take. But I think, I think it's I think it effectively sets up uh, a cognitive scenario. Yes, I think so. But uh, uh, you, you cannot continue to, to be worried about that. <laughs> no. But, but in that case, yes, I think uh, uh, I think it was intentional because I'm, I'm talking about it. Yeah. Uh, but if it was a concert situation, uh, probably I may or may not. Um, it's interesting that oh, this, yeah. this evening um, in the concert um, we've put two images in the program booklet because we do want you to look at those. Yeah, that's right. um, that's which is the, a, project, it's the first time I've ever done this, and I think June as well. So it's actually, we do want to load. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Have we got any other questions?
sense of perception and change because I was listening so much. And because my I've been invested all my working life so much in my visual perception, I actually became aware that that kind of slightly closed down, you know, my vision went a little bit, it just was a little bit further away. Like it, it, it's a very difficult thing to explain. I was very aware of it. And even now, Mm, well, you know, sort of a month and a half since I finished making my recordings and things, I can't, I can't, I can't get it back. And I'm still listening to footsteps. And I hear people come in and I think, oh, you know, and, and, and it triggered a little bit of probably raised my anxiety level for this sort of thing because I was always listening. I think you need to extend your cure. Mm, yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. 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 yeah, I know that yeah, there's this uh, famous performance artist, uh, Amrovich. When she did a low uh, performance uh, project uh, where she sat with a uh, in a in a gallery with with each person one minute. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When she did that, uh, sh I think she said it, it took three years to get away from. It. Mm -hmm. um, so so this this type of uh, uh, methodology you know, taking part in the collective journey because it's not only it's not only psychological. It's also very physical. Uh, your body learn uh, what you know, what you are you are processing. Yeah, and you can change it. Yeah, you can change it, but it takes a long time. Mm -hmm. So it's like something that's something you need to plan for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Fantastic. We'll take one last question. The things that have popped up, we can always address it later. But do we have any? Yeah. Uh, Manon Moriarty. So you spoke about reproducibility in uh, studio work. Uh, do you find? Because most composers want to actually perform the work, they get, they get perplexed by um, the different acoustic characteristics of the performance space, and then try to reproduce the experience of the studio yeah. in the concert. Yeah. Or is it something we should embrace the new acoustic uh, qualities? I think the older studio aesthetics uh, that I found interesting is uh, these are not these, these are not facts. These are the uh, the assumptions. But uh, it seems because the reason I call aesthetics is because although these are assumptions, uh, many many of us are so much poorly organized. So, for example, reproducible. Most time it'll be a force, but uh, there's a sense of a kind of a force that when you produce something in the studio, it's it's a very present in uh, in commercial world. When you produce something in the studio. It should be presented really well in any way you go. So they, they do this track. I know this because I was first tra trained as a recording engineer. So you, you bring your master kind of black master thing and you play in any way, you know, in a car. Mm -hmm. That kind of thing is, is a force in that, in that place. And so reproducible is a, I would even say a, a, a force, a force word, but it's, uh, it's, a, it's just that the place the way it is set up kind of uh, empowers that idea. So uh, to answer your questions, yes, I, I uh, for me, the, uh, even me, uh, you know, I hear some, I, I made some mistakes in, in my home studio and I thought it's really great, it's amazing, but then you're going to a concert hall, most time, most time you're really, really surprised.